welcome Lars and Mark to the interview. Uh, really happy to have you guys here today. Uh, do you guys want to give a quick introduction about yourself and what you're working on right now? Uh, why don't we start with Lars? Okay, so I, um, my background's a little weird. Um, I'm a Norwegian citizen who was born and raised in Texas. My mom's Norwegian, my dad's American. So there's a connection to a podcast called The Nordic Model. Um, so I know a little bit about Norwegian policy stuff because I've lived there for a bit and studied it. But then um, I got interested in Georgism about 10 years ago for boring reasons. Um, but then a um, opportunity came up to enter a book review contest where I wrote a book review about progress and poverty, which is Henry George's big book. And um, for the Astral Codex 10, that's got Alexander's uh, blog. And uh, to my surprise, it won first place and people are super interested in it. Um, so that's kind of my recent claim to fame. And the other thing um, that's kind of my connection to Georgism and the Nordic model and everything is that um, my day job is in video games. I'm an analyst and a consultant. I basically try to keep investors from throwing money away. And to my like shock and horror right now, all these cryptocurrency games you might've heard about are all replicating all of the problems of the real world housing crisis in the virtual digital world with digital real estate and digital land light assets. And it's all playing out exactly as Henry George predicted. And I'm just, so now my day job is to scream at investors to learn the lessons of Georgism before they lose all their money. Um, so that was completely <laughs> unexpected, but it like crashed into my professional life. This, you know, uh, econ idea I'd been into for like a decade. That's really interesting that there's, you know, transfers over to a video game out and at like an analyst job. It's incredible, really cool. Uh, Mark, you want to go next? Howdy there, uh, Mark. Uh, Mark Molino, uh, based out of the Bay Area. Uh, Bay Area, you know, famous for its awful housing uh, scene. I've been involved in community radio out here for, you know, a decade. And uh, within the last five years, got into Georgism and kind of parlayed that into my own radio show and podcast, the Henry George Program. Uh, you know, can be talking about, you know, kind of the larger ideas here, but, you know, sometimes just kind of getting the nitty gritty of, you know, how does housing work? Why isn't it affordable and so on? So I'm trying to learn from whoever I can uh, who's, who's working these scenes and just, uh, you know, talk to people. And I think, uh, you know, I think we're, you know, becoming less ignorant every year about how to make housing work a, a bit better. So. Mm -hmm. And like, as, as we know, in the kind of communities that we surround ourselves in the Twitter, uh, Land value taxation seems to be one of the integral solutions in that overall kind of project of amazing, making housing more affordable and more equitable. So I'm really interested to delve into that today. Um, it's, it's been sort of like a nebulous thing that people point to when they say, like, how do we fix housing policy? But I'm really excited into getting into the nitty gritty, like you were saying. So uh, let's get let's get started with some easy questions, which is, you know, what is land value taxation and what problem specifically is it trying to solve? I take that one, Mark. Okay, I can start. I mean, I, I think it's it, there's always a, a difficult thing like progress and poverty. The book starts with uh, you know, Henry George takes like 50 pages and say, okay, let's start with a definition of capital. But he just goes on and on and gets this very, very specific definition and moves on from there. So I feel like sometimes the simple questions take a lot of time to unpack. So to talk about what land value taxation is, I would say broadly, you know, maybe look at the the impact. It tries to deflate speculation in natural resources. It tries to basically drive prices of, uh, of natural resources down, which is to say to open up access to everyone while actually diverting the benefit of these resources to the general public instead of specific asset holders. Uh, and it does it through, you know, assessing a value of, of, of land and, 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 and imposing it through a, a taxation authority. I, I think there's a lot of details to get into it. I don't know if that's the best angle at large. you have anything, any better way? How do you pitch an elevator? Because I'm usually, I think I'm talking <laughs> to people who are brain diseased enough. They don't need the, the simple pitch. Yeah. So, so my, my approach is like the whole part of land value taxation, it, it flows out of basically George's fundamental insight that every other economic model is whether it claims to be or not is effectively two factor in practice. There's labor and there's capital and that's what we use to make stuff. Um, but George says there's also land. And the thing that's different about land than labor and capital, I mean, everyone else acknowledges that land exists but they wind up either calling it capital or treating it as if it is with capital. And the thing about capital is you can make more of it. Land you can't make more of. And George, you know, calls land, by that he means, you know, dirt 
you know, surface area of the earth, locations, coordinates on the globe, but he also means all natural resources and opportunities. So he's also including orbital real estate for satellites. He's also including electromagnetic spectrum. He's also including uh, water rights and mineral rights and oil rights and all of that stuff too. Um, but the, the simplest and most straightforward case that's like immediately applicable to the housing crisis is land. And the basic notion of land value taxation is because you can't make any more of land in, in, in either sense of, of how it's used, um, that means that it has special properties when you tax it. And one of the special properties of that is that you don't get any less of it. The reason you get less of things when they're taxed is because there's some marginal oil well or some marginal tobacco farm that if you put a tax on cigarettes or oil, they're going to shut down production. But there's no land fairy working at the land factory that's like, oh boy, the land tax went up, better stop making <laughs> less land for next year. You know, and so because of that, you have a vertical supply curve, you know, but without getting into the nerdy econ details, it means if you tax land, you don't get any less of it, which means there's no dead weight loss. And long story short, and we can get into this later, it winds up meaning, and this has been empirically validated, that um, if you impose a land value tax, it's one of the only taxes that can't be passed on to the end consumer, like a tenant, right? If a landlord is taxed, they have to eat the tax. The price of the land um, under, ideal circumstances goes down and the, the holding the, the, the price to acquire the land goes down. Holding it, had, you have to pay the tax, right? And um, what this basically means is that if you do it at 100% of the value of the land, then there's no longer, I mean, the, the, the land price, not the land value, but the land price will, will approach zero. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the cost of holding it is high as it should be. Um, we can get into all the details behind that later, but what it means is that only someone who is willing to do something sufficiently useful with that land is going to want to hold it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's this ongoing cost they have to pay whether they're leasing it out or not. And so if land is free to hold, then anyone can see that an area that's growing, it's like, man, I got to get in there. I got to buy some land and wait for the neighborhood to show up and make my land valuable through their labor, not mine. And George's insight is that basically owners of land and natural resources are basically gatekeepers to the universe. You can't eat, sleep, work, or poop without access to a specific location to do any of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Try to do, do any of those things in the wrong place and see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, like sleep on a park bench, you'll get hassled by cops, right? Yeah. Um, poop in a house that's not yours and, you know, without permission, and you might, you might <laughs> run into That's a slippery trouble. slope. <laughs> yeah, you know, and... And so basically the idea is, is that um, labor should be compensated and capital should be compensated, but gatekeeping access to the universe, to the world, to the earth should, should not be compensated um, other than to just all of humanity, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to jump in here, maybe one, one point too is land value tax is a specific tool, whereas the Georgia's paradigm is an entire, I would say, way of analysis of looking at production versus rent seeking. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to say, like, there's other ways to approach it, you know, kind of public resource ownership is another way to deal with rents that isn't quite the land value tax, but it's part of, the, uh, part of the paradigm. And the paradigm is unusual because usually people have one or more choices. They approach it because it's efficient, it's going to work, it's pragmatic, or they do it because it's just, it's fair, it's the right thing to do. And usually you have to make a choice. But the Georgia's paradigm is, is very strange that people end up in the same place from either end, you know, if they're doing it for the sake of it's righteous or it's it's efficient. So mm -hmm. right. This is this is this seems like a little bit of a of a lefty podcast, but I mean I've found a lot of interest from right leaning people. Um yeah. this is one of those weird things that it, it kind of appeals to um both axes without really being a like trying to compromise or be wishy-washy about it. It's just it, it just kind of comes at the whole economic system from cross purposes and um without blathering on too long. Land value tax specifically is an implementation of Georgia's ideals, like Mark was saying. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, it's a way to make the value of land common property without taking all the land mm -hmm. and making it the government's property. It's yeah. a way to be like, leave all the land titles where there are, they are, but if you want to exclude people from property that the community made valuable, then you must compensate the community. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the basic idea behind it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that, you know, you guys brought all these concepts up specifically about kind of like um, 
uh, how, you know, you can't really pass uh, the land value tax on to like a tenant or something just because of how, you know, supply of land works. Because these are all, these are all topics that we're going to be going through in the, the course of the questions that we have. But my very next question is what we, you mentioned a little bit at the start, Mark, is, uh, you know, you, you tax like this assessed value of land. But how exactly is the value of this land determined? Because, you know, you hear the arguments, uh, the Georgist arguments, if I'm phrasing them correctly, is that the value of the land is generated by the kind of economic activity uh, that's generated around it by people that are in that community. But how is this assessed uh, in, in terms of how we want to tax that rent seeking behavior that we we're, we're seeking to curb, let's say? Lars is going to have a lot more to say than me. He's, he's, this is his whole paper he's, he's developing about the kind of comparisons. I would mostly say, I mean, I'd like to view it from very top level which is uh, you know, the same sort of functionalist approach, you want to look at the goals. The goals are unimproved lots should sell for about $0. If you see a fenced-in patch of dirt and you say, how much, or how much are they selling? Right now, it can be going for millions of bucks. But if you're doing it right, it should sell for $0, no more, no less. Mm -hmm. uh, they shouldn't be having to pay you to take off their hands. Uh, and you know, not every lot is going to be empty, obviously, uh, but that is at least one data point. And I think mostly it develop tools and iterate to achieve the ends you want. And I think uh, the assessment process right now is not ideal. And I think, uh, as Lars is saying, there, uh, there's a lot of ways that I think the future is looking bright. Why don't you go, go more on it? Yeah. So let's let's start from the top. So so assessment. This is a this is probably the best objection to Georgism, the one that's made in the most good faith and the most like is based off of, you know, what the empirics say, um, because the status quo of land appraisal assessment is not great um, in terms of actual practice. But in terms of methods, we've got some really great methods that are in use in certain places. And let me talk about the approach. So it's like, how, how can say what land is worth, right? And when we say the value of land, um, what we specifically mean is you know, George, unlike Marx, um, subscribed to what we would now call the marginal theory of value, which is what is the value of the single is what the market will bear for it, right? Um, and so when you're trying to assess land, you have two challenges. First, um, if it hasn't been sold lately, you know, well, it hasn't, you know, no one has paid anything for it. So you don't know exactly what it would bear in the market. You're, gonna, you're trying to predict that, right, based off of other things. Um, and then also, mm -hmm. if you have land and buildings together, you know, how can you assess the land separately from the buildings? And some people say you can't do it. It's impossible. You should never even try. Give up now, um, which seems really bizarre to me um, because we split the atom and went to the moon. Why should we not be able to figure this out? Um, and so I've been doing an empirical follow up to my book review, um, which I'm going to be submitting to Scott soon. Um, and one of the big questions I'm trying to answer is, can you empirically, you know, get good at valuing unimproved land. And so the metaphor, not metaphor, but example I like to start with is an easy case. So imagine a parking lot, right? Pretend for a moment that parking is a good thing. You know, that is not something I would necessarily- I'm gonna try really hard. I'm gonna really, I'm gonna try really hard for you. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So there's a couple of things involved in land value. And the thing we're really interested in is land income, right? So imagine a parking lot. What is the annual land rent of the parking lot? Well, it's basically whatever you can manage to raise from people parking in your parking lot, right? You know, whether it's one giant mobile home that stays there all year or a bunch of cars coming in and out, you know, that's a really pure example of pure land rent. You've done almost nothing to that land. You're just renting out the location. So whatever you can charge from a tenant is your annual land income, boom. You've assessed the land, like here's the land income. So how do you get from there to land value? Well, you can observe how much someone is willing to pay to purchase that land. And what you tend to observe is that people have what's called the capitalization rate, which is based off of a time preference, right? You know, if I make, I don't know, $10,000 a year in parking fees from some plot of land, um, and I'm willing to wait 10 years to break even, then I'm willing to pay up to, um, um, 10 years times whatever the annual income is, you know, so I'm willing to pay $100,000 for this in order to break even in 10 years off of its annual income, right? And you, and we have observed capitalization rates, um, and that'll, that'll come in in a second here. But so, okay, so you've got a parking lot, right? So right next door to it is a townhouse, right? 
And that townhouse is on a lot the exact same size. And so the house is like the exact same size as the lot, right? Exact same size as the parking lot. And, um, but instead of being worth $100,000, it's worth like $120,000. Well, the house is probably worth $20,000, right? Because they're in pretty much the exact same location. And um, that method is what's called the building residual method of assessment, where you figure out based off of comps, you know, however you figure it out, you figure out what the land is worth, assess that first, subtract that out from the total observed, like, like say that house sold like 10 seconds ago for $120,000. Then you would subtract out the value of the land and then you get the value of the building separately. What most, what a lot, not maybe not most, but a lot of people use is the building, is the land residual method, also known as the cost approach. And this, we believe, chronically undervalues land. Um, and yeah, I, I should have, at the start, I should have mentioned the three basic approaches, cost approach, income approach, and um, sales or comparison approach or market approach. Cost approach is where you figure out how much it costs to make the building, subtract that. Um, income approach is you figure out how much it makes per year, use the capitalization rate, that gives you your sales price. And then the market approach is that it's like this one sold for that, and this one sold for that, but this one's a little different, so we adjust, and so on and so forth. Um, we have a lot of data. That's the thing. You know, if you really just use your data pretty smartly, you get a lot of information. You know, right. it's not like some black box. You know, it's a hundred years, like 150 years ago, someone would go around and be like, I think this is worth that because I feel I've like been it. feeling my stomach. Yeah. Nowadays, you can set GIS data against these things and you can get huge databases of comps of real market transactions. You can do multiple regression analysis and um, like I've done some machine learning, right? And so multiple regression analysis and machine learning will basically tease out the contribution to your final target value of all the properties you care about. And a bunch of super innovative um, methods have come out in the last 10 years, right? But even in the 70s, we had pretty good methods for doing this. But um, yeah, but just like as an example of the cost approach and why it's not good, um, let's say you have a amusement park, right? With roller coasters on it. And um, the cost approach would be like, calculate the value it costs to build your roller coasters and then apply depreciation, subtract that value from the last, you know, total price it costs to buy the land. And that's what the land, uh, uh, to buy the whole park. And that's what the land is worth. The problem with this is, okay, um, but what if that though nobody cares, nobody wants to buy an amusement park with roller coasters on it. They want to buy it, tear down the roller coasters and build apartments. You know, because I'm not going to, I'm not interested in operating a theme park. If none of your buyers are interested in operating a theme park, your roller coasters aren't worth whatever it costs to build them times depreciation. They're worth zero, you know, especially if there's like a theme park down the road that's putting you out of business, right? You know, there's, so. Um, there's weird edge cases there. The dark store theory is that big box stores, in fact, suppress land values because they actually can only be used for these big wasteful ends. I think the ideal of like, you know, applying assessment is like, it really is like a chaotic, you know, downtown core where any parcel could be anything. And I think when you get out to kind of bespoke weird stuff, you know, all bets are off. I think it takes a lot more because, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, assessment is more the fact that land value is because of the community. It's about surrounding it. You know, if you build, you know, amusement park in the middle of nowhere, yeah, that's not really because of the community. Right. Where would you rather put a hot dog stand in the middle of the desert or next to an empty lot next to Times Square? Right. You're going to sell a lot more hot dogs in the second one. And that's because of the value and the hard work that the community of New York has done in creating a bunch of people who want hot dogs. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, sorry if I just like fire hosed you there. But, but the bottom line is that generally you want to assess land directly. And we have a lot of good methods for doing that. Um, a lot of it involves fancy ass computers. Um, but basically, the better access you have to ground truth market data and public records, and um, then, then the better your assessments are. But um, generally speaking, I, I attended a five-week seminar with Ted Bartney, who is a, um, a major assessor um, and, and a Georgist. And he says that it's always better to try to assess the land directly rather than trying to assess the buildings, not just for the cost approach, but also like if you're trying to assess a building, you have to like... How, how much roof damage was there from the last hailstorm? Did you remodel your bathroom in the last five years? Like, and you got to like invade everyone's privacy and stuff, but the land's value is mostly because of its location. So if you use the right methods, it's actually easier to get an accurate measure of the land. And therefore, because of algebra, the building, 
He mm -hmm. assess the land first. Okay. And that's really interesting. do it with computers and databases. And my article will go into way more dirty, nerdy detail than you could possibly imagine. Absolutely. And if it's if it's released before this podcast put out, we'll put it in the we'll put it in the description. Um, so anyway, uh, that uh, I guess leads into a uh, little bit of the next question, which is, uh, what do you think have the mo been the most like successful experiments on land value taxation so far? Because I know there's about like 20 cities in the U.S. that uh, implement land value taxation. I may be wrong on this, but what do you what do you guys see as the most successful kind of proof of concept of land value taxation so far? What do you mean by experiment? Do you mean like in terms of narrowly generating like some data or like a whole case study of? Uh, yeah, whole case studies probably, yeah, so somewhere it's been implemented to the extent that you would like, and you'd say it's kind of true to the concept that you've been uh, talking about in terms of land value taxation. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you can look at, you know, kind of, in America, people have tried different places. I mean, Pennsylvania is notable as a state in which it's written their constitution that people can toy with uh, setting split rate land versus, uh, you know, property taxation. I, I mean, honestly, I don't think it's that dramatic. I think you can look at the edges and say it helps. I think if there's something that's fascinating, it's where do we see really successful housing implementations that look at, uh, that look at dealing with land rent on like a societal basis. And uh, I think to plug a, a book, I think everyone should try to look at holding up the camera, even though this is audio, uh, Urban Land Rent by the Finnish scholar Anne Hyla. Uh, Singapore is a property state. So she is from Finland uh, and is documenting uh, the work in Singapore. And both are very similar in some ways. Both Helsinki um, and you know, Singapore are cities in which public ownership of land is fairly, uh, it's, it's a heavy majority. And with this, they can use basically leverage and you know in uh, Helsinki leverage is a, basically a buffer sock system of social housing uh, Singapore you know almost uh, you know 80 90 percent of people live in public housing there with this you know incredibly detailed structure of different agencies basically heavily commoditizing land but all within a public sphere and to me like that isn't a land value tax per se but it is, the public use of land rents in a way that scales. And, you know, in practice, we have seen kind of this public ownership model work, you know, in a way that uh, land value taxes, the incremental has been basically fought back because of, I mean, I'll, I'll point to home ownership, home ownership plus ability to tax revolts have been a disaster for, for uh, the success uh, politically. But uh, I'd say if you look at how the theory works as far as making public land work for everybody, Singapore, Helsinki, good examples. Uh, I would say in my own hometown, home area, um, Houston, in 1911 had a land value tax under J.J. Pastoriza, who was the Houston's first Hispanic mayor. Um, it was short-lived. It was just a couple of years. Um, but according to the Houston City Book records, it was, it was um, allegedly a smashing success. Um, that's mostly, you know, a lot of the data is lost to the winds of time. So you kind of have to take the people who wrote the stories down word about it. Um, but I mean, if you look at population records, other cities declined at the time while Houston stayed flat. Um, and then also the other reason to think that it's probably credible is that Pastoriza, despite having a lot of very powerful enemies, um, was elected mayor after the Texas Supreme Court dismantled the Houston, the Houston plan of land value taxation for Houston. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting historical state case study. I haven't studied as many of the other like more contemporary ones, but that one's interesting to me. Um, Norway has a very, if you consider, if you expand land to mean um, natural resources, I would argue that Norway with its severance taxes on oil has um, land value taxation in the, term, in the form of severance taxes on oil. And I think that has achieved the effects that Georgism predicts. Um, but, um, yeah, one other thing, this is a crappy example in a way, but Texas versus California in the housing crisis, right? Um, California famously has an anti-land value tax in the sense that it, it essentially establishes landed gentry. And it is basically the epicenter of the housing crisis. And Texas, although it had, for all its many, many faults, um, at least has among the highest property taxes in the nation. And, um, because, and property tax is not land value tax, but it's a partial land value tax, right? Um, the tax on buildings is not ideal, but part of that tax falls on land. 
And because of that, um, I think that is one of the major things that's holding the housing crisis back from infecting Texas. Now, there's a guy who's, char who's challenging uh, Abbott from the right called Huffines, who's running on, I don't think he has a chance, um, but he's running on an abolished property taxes platform. And if anyone wants to undermine him from the right, all you have to do is tell him that his plan is make Texas California again, because that's exactly <laughs> what would happen if we abolish Texas property taxes. It's the only thing keeping California style housing crisis at bay in Texas is that partial, partial land value tax that keeps people from just inflating house prices to the moon. Don't, mm -hmm. don't import California values. It, it's bad. <laughs> uh, but I, I just, I, I think just in general, it is worth looking at like maybe how it solved problems during a specific time and place and how it changed. I would say you look at Henry George's, you know, uh, you know, context, you know, in the 1880s, 1870s, 1890s. And this really lasted through the early 19, you know, you know, 1900s, 1910s we had desperate poverty in our city core and this was widespread low earning power uh and you know i think that there were basically two roads to be pursued one was the georgia's paradigm of basically socializing community wealth making you know better earning power fixing our cities the other one being hey how about instead we kind of pursue the frontier of the suburbs and at least in america that has been what we've done almost everywhere, you know, pretty much the entire Anglo world. Uh, and you can look at places like Singapore. That's for a place they didn't have the luxury of sprawling out. They're a tiny mm -hmm. little island. And a lot of Asia kind of worked similarly. Uh, and even in Europe, they kind of had, you know, they weren't as doomed as far as the suburbs, as far as we are, uh, because, you know, they didn't have cars, you know, as, as early as we did. And you, you still saw a lot of kind of George's activism lasting through the middle of the 20th century. Uh, in a way, because they were solving urban issues. And we did, you know, I think we took the easy way out. And I think the, what we're learning now is the suburbs may help you in a pinch, but those effects won't last forever. Because so you can look at the most highly suburbanized metros in the US, housing costs had been affordable, now they're soaring. And you can't just say, hey, why don't you drive another two hours to work every day, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way, the invention of the automobile and the highway in the suburbs is essentially a way to kick the can down the road, to extend the margin of production um, that George talks about that he gets from Ricardo and um, basically like stave off rent inflation for a couple of decades. And, but now, now it's time to pay the piper pretty much. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's not much more we can do to the, the, the crisis is basically upon us and we're, we're rolling back to similar conditions that were present when George first got popular, which I think is sufficient to explain him becoming popular again. Mm -hmm. That's really, it's, it's an excellent idea. I'm glad it's going it gaining traction, at least online. Um, and yeah, we can't afford, even like environmentally, we, can, we cannot afford the kind of sprawling that's going on. But it just, just like okay. exactly. Uh, so I want to, this question is interesting because it harkens back to your uh, first answer, which is, uh, you know, counterintuitive, maybe counterintuitively, uh, like a, a tax on the land value, uh, not only doesn't decrease the supply of housing, but it also kind of increases it. Can you like, can you guys go through how this works uh, in, in comparison to other taxes that decrease the supply? Well, yeah, because um, it's not a tax on capital, right? So houses are capital. Um, and um, property tax, in a way, um, you know, we want to land value tax wants it, some people say it's like, well, it's just property tax. So why, why, why do you have this magical property tax that's going to fix everything? Well, we're going to do two things. We're going to raise the tax on land. We're going to decrease the tax on buildings. Why would we want to punish people for building housing? We want them to do that. We want there to be more housing. But um, a necessary ingredient for housing is a place to put the house, right? Mm -hmm. And if people are just holding the land out of value, um, if they know that the value of that land is going to go up, then the easiest return on your investment is to do nothing, right? Um, to just, just hold the land and wait for it to go up in value so you can sell it to someone else. And, um, and if you already own land, you want to forbid other people um, that the thing that make you, you want to forbid other people from building houses, because that is going to increase the density of the population in the area. And that is going to decrease the demand for your land. Um, so you want to keep the demand as high as possible by opposing housing everywhere. Right. And that is what we see with the NIMBY mentality. You know, they'll mm -hmm. make all kinds of excuses and arguments, um, but it basically all boils down to they want to preserve the value of their property. And um, so if you and this, this is 
if you want to talk about economic models, this is what I saw in my career as, as a video game analyst and all these digital worlds that have digital land like assets. Um, there's a housing crisis in Ultima Online that's been going on for like 20 years. There's a housing crisis in Final Fantasy XIV. There's a housing, there was a housing crisis in EVE Online for like a couple of weeks until an economist implemented Henry George's land value tax and solved it. Um, basically, if someone has to pay for the privilege of holding land out of use, they're gonna be like, screw that, and they're gonna throw it on the market. So you're gonna kick out everyone who wants to speculate. Um, and all you're gonna have left is people who wanna actually do something with it, right? And so you're gonna be taxed on the value of that one square foot, but uh, um, of, of, that, of that footprint. But you can, every building up is, is pure profit, right? To use the metaphor again, pretend for a second that parking is good. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to build a surface parking lot, we're going to tax you for the full rental income of that surface parking lot. So now you're going to make nothing, right? Oh, you could at least build a parking garage, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so that we don't have 10 surface parking lots. We can just have it all in one space. All those nine other floors are going to be pure profit for you because we're not taxing your building. We're only mm -hmm. taxing the rental income you could make from the footprint. And um, that encourages you to build at the correct density for that area pretty organically without having to like set all these micromanaging rules. Like it's just a way to undistort the market and then let the market force actually be unterrible for once. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the basic idea. And it might be worth kind of underlining too, when you talk about capital here, you know, I think it can be a bit confusing as people look at it different ways. It was capital what capitalists own is capital basically all investment targets. Is because it if you see like, we want more people to invest and make money. It sounds like, oh, you want the capitalists to, you know, make, you know, make greater, you know, windfall profits. But really, I mean, if you talk about capital intensity, I, I think the social democratic program, you know, is not afraid of capital intensity. It knows it's a good thing. Having people have like, the George's definition would be like real depreciating tools and other stock that help production. And, you know, that's good. You know, we want better working machines that are more productive, more efficient, better, you know, better consumer goods in our lives as well. We just, you know, a higher standard of living is a good thing. Uh, and, you know, and if, uh, you know, if you, if you tax things at different rates, it matters basically what the chances are your taxes will hurt it, you know, and, and, and in this sense, uh, the land value tax paradigm is like a special case of Ramsey pricing of just you want to tax things more heavily that you can get away with. And if you tax it and you get less of these good factories, these good tools, these good you know, uh, consumer goods, tax it less. You know, we, we want more of the good things. And uh, as Lars was saying, you know, it, there is kind of a hot potato thing. You know, it, you know, when people get taxed for holding something unproductively, you know, they, they stop doing it. Mm -hmm. no, that's, yeah, that's really I, Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I cut you off myself. But yeah, um, the other thing is that um, I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's really cool that, you know, the question before we're talking about, you know, what are examples of, you know, a successful implementation of land value taxes, but, you know, you bring up the video game development cycle and how you could fix, at least on video games, like you were saying, EVE Online, you were able to fix that housing crunch just by implementing a um, land value tax. It's super cool to hear. That's never something I'd heard of before. So I, that, I just wanted to mention how really cool that was to hear that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want to go to the next question then? Yeah, sure. I, so I'm guessing you can't remember what we were about to say. So yeah, no, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I'll remember it. I'll remember it halfway through the next question. So. <laughs> no worries. Um, so anyway, so now we're going to get into uh, questions that people on Twitter uh, wanted to post to you guys. So uh, one of this is, so the data around this is ambiguous, but how much land rent is there in the U.S. that we can tax? Like, what is that? Total well, hers is numbers for you. <laughs> okay, let's go. The data go. is no here? longer ambiguous. Let me see. Okay. Uh, I've got it open in another tab right here. And so I'm going to, I compared 12 different methods. This is unpublished, but it'll be published maybe by the time this comes out, who knows. I compared 12 different methods for estimating the total land value of the United States. And the spread is like ridiculous. It's between um, something like, I forget, it's between like 19 and 65 trillion for the total land value. Now, let me look up the land rents. It's um, more of a magnitude. I consider that almost a success. You know, it's not like they're completely disagreeing what's out there. Yeah. And the, and the low value comes from using the cost approach, right? Which in previous years actually resulted in negative land values because 
it was so terrible. Um, but I think the figure that's most accurate is probably uh, Jeffrey Johnson Smith's um, 44 trillion. Um, probably, I won't bore you with the methodology, but bottom line, it's based off of an assessment method I think is sound that has the most contact with actual market transactions mm -hmm. um, versus some of the other ones that feel a little bit more made up. Um, let me find the land rents. Yeah, okay, so land rents, it depends on what capitalization rate you use. Um, but basically, I'll, I'll go ahead and share screen so you guys can see, even though this is an audio podcast, just <laughs> so you guys can see it. Um, we'll explain it to the listeners. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I can work on that, but I, I mean, just, just in general, yeah. that is a, you know, it's a big chunk of money. I know? got the number. I got the number here. Okay. Yeah. I finally found it. Okay. So depending on who you trust, the lowest end is if you use the federal reserves figures um, using a method Matthew Iglesias came up with and at a five or an 8% capitalization rate is between 1.1 and $1.76 trillion. If you use Smith's figures, which I believe a lot more, um, it's between 2.1 and $3.36 trillion. Now, let me contextualize that for you. Defense is 0.68 trillion of our annual budget. Social security is 1 trillion. Medicare and Medicaid together is 1.05 trillion and all other spending is 1.67. This means that at the lowest, most conservative, definitely low ball, just nonsense estimate, um, using the Federal Reserve figures at the lowest capitalization rate of 5%, we can pay for any one of defense, social security, or Medicare and Medicaid um, just with land value taxation at the mm -hmm. lowest, most conservative, definitely low ball estimate. And this was just urban land rents, not mineral rents. And this is also, there's there's an argument you made that as you oppose this, you'll get virtuous cycles. Cities will become more valuable. The more you actually invest in like infrastructure, this will soar further. You know, So this is kind of just out of the gate. That's a and lot that, of money on the table. And this is all being privatized right now for the right. almost and that's and, and that's also without considering the at core theory, all taxes come out of rents, which basically states that if you um, untax capital and income, that will further rise land values, then you tax that with land value tax to bring it back down, and then you re recapture um, mm -hmm. that. But anyway, like even if you don't include that or the dynamic effects that um, Mark is talking about, if you go with a high estimate of 3.36. That's enough to cover, let me see, you do the math in my head. That's enough to cover um, defense, social security, and Medicare and Medicaid all by itself, um, mm -hmm. just with land value taxation. Okay. That's that's in, in 2019. Money. This was before the pandemic, like super spending, but even then it's pretty good. And mm -hmm. um, urban, urban land values have recovered. People are like, oh, are cities ever to come back? They they came back. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like they're they're massively back in fact. Um that's really, yeah, that's that's, really because it leads into my next question, which was about like uh, Georges, at least the, the kind of old school types that there were, uh, said that, you know, land value tax can replace all existing taxes and fund the kind of government programs that we we ostensibly like to see. Uh, how, how, like, how would you, you know, state the accuracy or inaccuracy of this claim? Do you think it's a tax that would, plays would... along with a lot of the existing kind of tax system? Is that the single tax area you're, you're gesturing yeah. at? I would, I would even jump in here and say single tax is not really so much a theory as so much a political program. This was mm -hmm. proposed by Henry George in the context of the 1880s. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this, if you look at the 1880s, there was no income tax. There were no progressive taxes to speak of. The federal government was paid for through tariffs. You know, that was the, these excise taxes were the only real thing funding this enormously regressive forms. And, you know, he was saying for a different, bunch of different reasons. One, it's just good to get rid of these tariffs. The second one being... You know, he wasn't saying, oh, I am against uh, progressive income taxes in theory. In fact, he actually spoke very positively of them. And Georges were some of the first people to actually, you know, impose highly progressive income taxes, uh, as well as excess profit taxes and, and so on. But uh, he was more or less saying that, you know, uh, you know it's, this is on the plate. You know, just use this as a tax for everything, meaning try to get the tariffs off the table. You know, I think right now it's like, hey, let's get sales taxes off the table, table as far as a massive uh, regressive tax out there. Uh, but I, I think, you know, you can make the argument. Some people do say that, you know, you can pay for a huge chunk of things through it alone. But I would certainly say that you could say other forms of rent persist. The benefits you get by being massively rich, you kind of, that money makes money in different ways. Not so much from investments, but just extra privileges, uh, wage compression. There's a certain social benefit in that in itself. So I would say that 
I think you can look at for the what you want out of society. I'd say most modern Georgias are not single taxers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that program is, has ceased to really be useful, especially, you know, there, if you've made a billion dollars, some funny businesses happen. So if you just kind of tax wealth at highly progressive scales, you're kind of plugging the holes in all the different ways that rent persists. There's, um, yeah, so it, it's interesting because I know a bunch of modern day single tax Georgers, Georgists, um, and they're, the way they would put it is that they're not single taxers in the sense of they're against all taxes. They just think that LVT is sufficient to cover everything and that they believe that the naive figures I've shown out are like almost enough. And then if you also factor in the dynamic effects, then basically, you know, like, like basically all taxes come out of rents, whether you like it or not. Um, but it's better to tax land rent than it is people's labor or people's investment or people building houses or, or whatever you know, because that's more efficient for the economy, because then we get more of all the stuff we want, like people working hard and people building houses and people, you know, um, putting investment in stuff. Like right now, a lot of people, you know what they invest in? They invest in land, you know? So um, land becomes a worst, inve- like it's a huge portion of bank loans. But another figure is that America is a little hard to estimate. Like I had to go and do all this math and triangulate all this stuff and people probably pick at it, but Australia has really good land value um, databases. And so Terrence Dwyer down in Australia um, uh, did some estimates and he found that Australia's land income compared to all taxes in Australia, something like 70, 75% um, as much. And if you just compare it to the company and personal income taxes, I don't know what those correspond to here in America, but that's just his words. It is like 147 to 136% of those. So it's more than enough to abolish company and personal income taxes in Australia and replace them wholesale with LBT. Um, and I don't know what else they're taxing in Australia, um, mm-hmm. but presumably they're taxing something. Um, but of course, of course government rate. spending could go up to benefit, you know, it's not like there's like a natural limit right now, mm-hmm. you know, more, more is better. You know, if, if you can imagine, you know, a lot of people say like, you could have both investment in all the infrastructure you need, as well as a generous UBI that people could live on. You know, we don't mm. do that now, but we, we could. And I, th- I think just worth mentioning, too, you talk about like land as far as ground rents, you know, economic land includes monopoly rents. It includes, you know, mineral rents, uh, intellectual property rents. And, you know, if you look at the original, I think the, the, the paradigm is more or less, if there's monopolies, we should either abolish them or socialize them. If there's IP, we should get rid of it. Or if it has a social benefit, try to balance it so it actually creates what we need and, and no more. So, you know, and that's in, you know, you look at where the wealth goes. Look at the amount of actual like major firms. In the past, it used to be the firm assets were like real stuff. Now it's all intangibles. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, it's a huge majority in like. And then they set up is... an Irish company to license the, to own the IP that's licensed back to the American company so they can do the double dutch with an Irish sandwich. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, all, it's highly financialized, you know, rent seeking in other forms, you know, at the very least in the end, is it really producing all the stuff we need? I think it's a lot of kind of razzle dazzle that in the end, isn't really improving our quality of life as much as it could have, if we're being more pragmatic about it. And mm-hmm. we also need to keep in mind the Henry George theorem, you know, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz uh, demonstrated this in, I think, the 70s. And the mm-hmm. Henry George theorem says that public goods spending and public goods are a specific kind of good. Um, mm-hmm. I think they're non rival Most municipal infrastructure for the most part. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. But um, in the strong or the weak form of it, basically, when the government does public spending, land values tend to rise, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, people want to build next to um, transit lines, right? Yeah. Or they want to own the land next to transit lines, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of or the if major... you have good schools in an area, you want to live where the schools are good. Right. You know, yeah, that's a classic example. Right. And, um, and and all sorts of things you want to build next to, you know, where the society is investing. And then who gets the benefits of society investing? It's the private landowners. And then society is like, OK, well, we need to build more stuff. Well, I guess we tax people's income and labor or we go into debt, which which, which, which indirectly taxes people's income and labor. And, um, and then who benefits from the next round of funding? Well, it's the private landowners. Whereas if you basically implement LVT, you know, as land value soaks up the value of building cool and important and valuable stuff for the community, the community itself can benefit from it and then reinvest that in the next round of cool stuff. And then that 
increases the land values, which get taxed out by LVT, and they can reinvest that in cool stuff. And then society can basically fund itself without basically, you know, allowing, you know, private landowners to just enjoy all of the value. Right. Mm -hmm. Stiglitz even says like at a certain point you'll get an optimal size city that like is you can't really put more infrastructure in it. It's like it's perfect at this size. And I, I think at the very least our cities have not reached that scale yet. You know, it's a bit uh, kind of utopian yeah. in, that, in that sense. But it's it's a model. You know, but it has some some pretty useful ideas. Yeah. So, yeah. Certainly... Sorry. Okay. Now go ahead. Go ahead. But yeah, I mean, it's certainly better than the current status quo, like wherever the limits are and like whatever you know the fall off rate of how much is captured privately versus whatever. It's like. It, it, it's certainly better to at least try something like that than the current status quo, which is just like someone sees the city is going to move out here, they buy all the stuff, and then they just sit on it, and they can charge as much as they they can charge right up to the margin of productivity, and then just you know it, it, when you really think of it, the current status quo is a really regressive private system of taxation, mm -hmm. right? That's the real way to think of it. We have a private class of tax agents who um, are extracting value out of all of us um, just for the right to access the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's it. I, I like that um, it's uh, not just like a single tax thing, but it's more of like a, like a George's framework to approaching the taxation of rent seeking, which I think is uh, uh, really cool. And that's what most Georgists that I've had interaction with online talk about. Uh, so I, I, I want to get a little bit into the, the political viability and feasibility of the taxation, because those were, uh, you know, hotly... Uh, asked questions. So we know that there's uh, tremendous eff efficiency gains to be made from land value taxation, but is it politically viable? We know, as you guys have mentioned before, that landowners are like a vested and powerful political group. How do we get a land value tax passed? Um, is it not much more, is, is, is it that much more difficult? Like let's compare to other strategies like real estate investment trust that could buy up land and capture rent in that way. Like what do you guys see as the political viability of this solution? I'll go first and then I'll let Mark go because I, I perceive that we might be coming from different places on this one. Um, I think I might be the naive optimist here, but um, my basic observation is that we have property tax regimes now, right? And um, a lot of people complain in Texas about property taxes, but they pay them anyway. And um, I, I asked Ted Guartney this because he's an assessor, you know, and one of his big obsessions was going around fixing undervalued land, which means he was raising everyone's assessments, right? And I was like, well, didn't everyone revolt and hate you? And he says, you know, you didn't actually get all that many complaints. Like um, what people really obsess about is assessments about their building. Cause then they're like, well, I did this and I did this and I did this. With the land, you show them all your calculations. You show, hey, look, the giant field next to you is worth a million. So, you know, yours is worth a million times the relative size of the, the place, you know? And there wasn't much they could say to that. And, you know, okay, you either take his word for it or not. Um, but that kind of gives me some hope. And then, you know, I think um, in, there's also a way politically is if you um, campaign on, it's like, hey, we're gonna untax your building. So if you build a second floor or you build an addition, you're not gonna pay any more tax. You know, that's one way to sell it. Another way is if you can get the UBI in, you know, what George called a citizen's dividend, Mm -hmm. you know, and pay back out to people, then a lot of people's taxes are going to go down. Um, and then even sometimes, even without that, like I calculated for my own property tax, like I don't live deep in an urban core, like in urban cores, it's like exponential fall off from the, from the city center, what the land value is. It gets super expensive as you get close, as you go further out, it gets less. And like my property is currently assessed at like a 16% like land share, like the land is like 16% of the value, which is ridiculous. Um, it should be something probably more like 40%. And if you did 100% LVT at 40% of like, based off of 40% of my property value being land and then used like a 5% or 8% cap rate, like I would save 500 bucks on my property taxes actually, you know? So mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's necessarily the case. Like, like when people hear 100% LVT, they're like, oh my gosh, I have to pay the full value of my land every year. It's like, no, 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 no. The full value it would cost you to rent out your land as a parking lot, you know, or, or, or to just rent out the land to someone who wanted to, you know, lease it to live there or you do, do whatever with it. Um, and so that's, you know, between five to 10%, depending on the area of the land value. And mm -hmm. so I think it's potentially politically feasible. I think in Texas, it's blocked by a Supreme Court, um, uh, not a Supreme Court, Texas constitutional uh, statement, which we mm -hmm. could 
reform with a, um, a simple referendum, I think. Um, there were a bunch of state constitutional amendments this year that were like really dumb. Um, and then, you know, I also think that a bunch of the tax assessors and a bunch of the commissioners who appoint the, the, the land value assessors, um, if you go and look at all those local elections, they run, at least in Texas, in unopposed primaries. And then uh, like they run unopposed in the general or when they run opposed in the primary or the general, they like win by like a margin of not much, you know? So I feel like that's kind of low hanging fruit of just fixing assessments would recreate a partial land value tax mm -hmm. just by raising the land values. Um, and then you would see partial benefits from that. So I think you could kind of do a bottoms up approach. I'm gonna let Mark talk about the more big brain uh, thoughts on political viability, but I think there's, we shouldn't get defeatist before we've even really tried. And I think mm -hmm. if we can get some good victories in other states that have like, like Pennsylvania has much better records and allows you to do split rate, you know, get some good case studies. I mean, I think you can make a case for it. I think it could become popular. And I think it's only going to become more popular as the housing crisis worsens. That's, that's my optimistic take. That's the optimistic pessimist take. I, I agree with that part. Certainly. Uh, I would say, I would say broadly, I think the kind of, you know, the kind of, you know, fire and brimstone, you know, anti-capitalist take is the American dream has been built upon passive real estate speculation in a way that is at once unsustainable and is too very hard to wind down. We have many entrenched interests that have been sold a bill of goods saying that invest in, in, in real estate, you'll make money for free. And here's the thing, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy insofar as we have state capacity, which has been concerned foremost with making sure that passive real estate speculation is rewarded. You know, that is their goal. And there has been highly classist and racist ends to this. We always leave the poor, the renters out to dry as we make sure that people who have invested in their homes always are made out good. 2008, people who invest in the margins, people who try to get on the homeownership ladder were cut off, but you know, in the core, in you know, in our affluent, ritzy suburbs, that they, they they made up their money pretty well. So the real question is like, how like is this going to go on forever? Uh, and I think it kind of relates to other issues, like generational strife. You know, the fact it's boomers against zoomers here. You know, in a lot, lot of way, people who are young don't expect that this is going to work out for them. I think a lot of people are trying to say, okay, suck it up, I'll join them. You know, they'll get on the homeownership ladder. I think a lot of people don't feel it's, you know, this is going to work out for them, especially if they are in the places, if you're in the Bay Area, it's you either suck it up, you're going to be a renter forever, or you're going to move. And I think broadly, I think there's very interesting, uh, there's a, a great uh, essay uh, on Phenomenal World by uh, uh, Yakov Feigen, uh, who wrote, uh, it's called The Deflationary Block. And there's an overall theory, which is the fact that we failed to implement full employment in our country, the fact we sold out our labor in the 70s, the consolation prize in a lot of ways was the fact, okay, you know, your quality of life, your earning power may decrease, but we're going to make sure that homeowners are going to get a nice, you know, lift in their value over time. And that has kind of been our policy. It's been anti-worker, but pro-landowner. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's sustainable for too much longer. I think people are getting fed up with it. And I think we're really reconsidering kind of the Volcker paradigm as far as full employment. And if we deal with this, we're going to actually, you know, I think if you really make full employment a reality, you have to deal with ownership of resources in a way that we just don't right now. Mm -hmm. I think another thing is, um, it's, it's, it's what Gordon Tullock calls the transitional gain, gains trap. Um, and his, his metaphor was taxi medallion specifically, but it's, this, it's, it's any system where the first generation gets in cheap and they get some system of benefits for themselves and they realize all those benefits. And then the next generation has to pull, pay full price for whatever that benefit is. And the value of that benefit has been priced into it. And now if you try to take it away, you're going to screw, you're going to potentially screw over this generation of people. And so they're going to fight like hell to keep it. Right. And that's where I think, you know, you have to do some horse trading and some finesse to, um, to get it to work. And that's where, you know, the, um, you, you know, things like UBI, like redistributing um, part, um, part of LVT as UBI to basically make it so that people only above a certain level of land value that they're sitting on are actually going to net out negative. And I've done the math and it seems like it's, it's a very reasonably high figure, you know, um, but I mean, it, it is a problem that we've created this 
And the, the generational gap, I think, is a ticking time bomb. Right. It's a pyramid you know? scheme, you know, yeah. and how do you, it's very hard to wind down pyramid schemes. And I think it's, it is re- recruiting. Like in the last, in the last two years, we have gotten people direct checks in the mail for a living. And that's encouraging. I think that's a new form of very successful politics. And if we use this as a way to wind down the pyramid schemes, I, I'm pretty optimistic. Good things will happen. Right. I mean, any, 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 you know, I come from Texas, so I'm probably, I'm weird politically. It's hard to pin me down as left or right, but um, just, I'm used to being surrounded by right-wing people, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so to any of them who are listening here, one of the reasons all the Hispanic people in Texas who had never voted Republican before, one of the biggest reasons they voted um, and swung away from the Democrats who just smugly asso- assumed that they were just a, um, they're, they're an, an in the back voting block, they said, it's like, hey, I got a check in the mail with Donald Trump's name on it. And that's why I voted for him, you know? Because, you know, some... some I don't understand why Biden didn't put his name on the checks. seems like an own goal. But, um, but anyway, like, I mean, people, that was one of the most popular things Trump ever did was, was you know, was that. And um, one of the most popular things Biden did too, by the way. And I think, you know, there's, there's appetite for that, especially in the younger generation. Um, you know, if you look at the charts, like I have a, a chart of, well, this is a new podcast, I won't bother showing it, but it just shows the home ownership rate of each generation and we're not going to catch up, right? I mean, maybe when all the boomers die, I mean, the, the, the rich millennials and Zoomers will inherit, but I mean, I'm a millennial, I'm 37. Yeah, I, I happen to be a homeowner because I'm incredibly lucky, right? But most of my friends are not, right? And mm-hmm. we're all like 35, 37, 38, like pushing 40. And we still have this mentality that we're young, which is perpetuated by the fact that we, most of us have yet to, you know, achieve the things our parents did when they were like 22, you know, and the, what, what is it going to look like for Zoomers, you know, you mm-hmm. know, if, if you can't get on the housing ladder, you know, if two successive generations basically can't get on the housing ladder, I'm not sure you can put this off. Like in George's time, there were basically three choices. It was either socialist, communist revolution in America, Georgism, or automobiles. And we picked automobiles, you know, um, that's, that's a gross simplification, but, um, you know, we've done automobiles. So, so w- which is it, right? You know, yeah. so like, so like to anyone, y- y- you know, um, maybe jetpacks next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tunnels. Oh yeah. Yeah. The hyperloops. Yeah. No, I, I really like Mark, what you were talking about in terms of full employment, that it's, um, it's, kind of, it's, 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 it's an explicit policy choice, right? Uh, there's this, uh, I think it's Chris Dillo or Mark Dillo. He wrote an article about this. But like Norman Lamont, who was like Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 1990s in the UK, he specifically talked about how this unemployment was a price worth paying to keep that inflation under control. So it's been an explicit part of our doctrine when dealing with the kind of, you know, Taylor, uh, the, the, the balance between unemployment and inflation is to always prefer to keep inflation low at the price of all this unemployment. And then to make unemployment as painful as possible for people by making these benefits so meager. So it's really nice to tie into what... Um, Lars was saying too about to, you know you, you get these you get these beefed up welfare check you get these beefed up like unemployment benefits and people really do love it it's it's super cool. Um, yeah, I would but say anyway. just just one, one more thought on that too. I think the 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 uh, Georgia Nobel winning prize uh, economist uh, William Vickery I think it's some of the most interesting thoughts about mm. full employment. And more more or less I love his definition of what he calls chock full employment. What the world should be, which is real full employment is when anybody can within 48 hours, get a new job that will pay them a living wage. And we are so far from that world. And it is important, like what's really interesting about that is it is a, it's a definition of employment that it incorporates the cost of living because if the cost of living is, is, is soaring, you know, it doesn't matter if you get a job, it needs to be a job that sustains you. And I think we need to look at habitation and working as one combined unit and not two separate issues. Mm-hmm. Absolutely agree. Um, okay, I want I want to get into the final question, and this is lightning round. What, <laughs> no, this is for what Lars mentioned at the start, and you probably you could jump in on this too, Mark. But you talked about uh, you know how do you guys think Georgism? This is this is for our listeners. This is just pandering to the social democratic fantasy. But how does Georgism Georgism fit into the Nordic model, or more broadly, the social democratic concept? In the beginning, Lars, you talked a little bit about how Norwegian oil policy is a little bit informed by a a Georgia's framework. Uh, Can you explain that? And also, Mark, you wanted to go into a little bit about how does this overlap with the social democratic projects? Why don't we break that up into two? Lars, you go first and then Mark. Is that cool with you guys? 
Yeah, sure. So there's actually, Denmark has a history of land taxation. Uh, it's not full on, uh, fully automated luxury space Georgism, um, but they do have a history of uh, land value taxation. And actually the capstone study that in my mind proves that uh, land value taxation cannot be passed on to tenants comes out of Denmark. And it's one of the few studies that gets around the endogeneity problem in a brilliant way. It's a great paper. Um, but um, Norway is interesting. Like Norway, I don't think has as much a history of land taxation, but what they do have is a very Georgist approach to natural resources, specifically the oil business. So growing up in Texas, most of the Norwegians I had contact with were people in the city of Houston, who are mostly there, Norwegians over on for low, you know, who are, who are here for, for oil jobs, right? Because Houston's like the oil capital of the world in a lot of ways. Um, and Norwegians, despite being like very environmentalist, are like super into the oil business. We'll get into you know, the oil business and whether that's a good thing or not and all the, the problems there. But, but for, for a moment, like it's the 70s. Um, and basically there's a man named Farouk al Kasim, which is not a super Norwegian sounding name because he is an Iraqi and uh, he's a petroleum engineer and he is very familiar with the resource curse, which is where a country is bestowed with natural resources and what ends up happening is that the government creates an economy around extraction, which means it doesn't have to invest in an economy based on people, right? So it doesn't invest in healthcare, education, you know, and human rights, whatever, you know? So Farouk al Qasim marries a Norwegian woman and um, moves to Norway, becomes a Norwegian citizen. And we, Norway is like bumbling around, like we got all this oil in the North Sea, what do we do with it? And um, my dramatized version of it is I imagine Farouk al Qasim checking his watch and realizing he has 10 minutes to write a policy paper to stave <laughs> off disaster before Norway becomes like Iraq did and every other country he's seen that has been bestowed with natural resources. And he writes a policy paper and he basically says, um, what Norway needs to do is they need to, um, they need to not just nationalize oil. That's the easy answer, but they need to do something a little more uh, nuance than that. They need to set up two uh, entities. They need to set up a national oil company and a national oil regulator, right? And they're kind of adversarial uh, against each other. But also they create a private public partnership with public, with, 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 with like um, private companies, you know, to extract oil, shell oil and all those bad guys, right? Um, but what's going to happen is we are going to subsidize the exploration of oil and at the same time tax the extraction. And the extraction is like something ridiculous. It's like 90%. But when you think about this, it's like, this is what you want to do, right? The extraction is like, that's the people's oil. That is the Norwegian people's oil. Granted, we respect, choose to respect borders or whatever, you know, granted that the mm -hmm. Norwegians have oil at all, that's their oil, right? And so you don't get to just sit on an oil well and just take whatever comes out. But we understand that you have costs. It costs you a lot of money to build a rig and to explore and to find the oil in the first place. So we're going to pay for like basically all of that. You know, you come to us, we'll subsidize all your exploration. But the minute it starts flowing out the tap, you give us 90%. Now, if you look at the balance sheet, this is a great deal. It's like, yeah, the margin is way lower, but there's no risk. So you just go around. And um, then also, Kasim was very intent on getting as much oil out of a well as possible. And so if you've got this high extraction tax and, and subsidies for exploration, that also means like getting better at the state of the art. So instead of sitting back and just collecting resource rents, um, you're going to invest in all kinds of better methodology. And sorry if you're hearing my kids in the background, <laughs> um, but you're going to get you invest in better methodology and better technology and also um, more efficiency. And um, and then the oil regulator is there to keep watch, make sure you're not spilling oil left and right, like the incompetent folks at BP, you know. Um, and what basically happens is like, this is the least worst way you could possibly run an oil empire, basically, is that um, instead of the oil rents just going to private companies, they go to the people, they go right into the sovereign wealth fund. And then the oil companies get as good at, in, in, and one of them is of course a Norwegian national oil company, mm -hmm. um, gets as good as possible at finding the oil and extracting it and improving the state of the art. Um, the downside, of course, is that this is oil, this is, you know, fossil fuels, this is bad for the environment. Um, but hey, isn't it nice that all of that money is now in the social wealth fund where we can now, you know, um, think about what we did and, you know, create a better future rather than it all just going into the hands of private oil companies who have no incentive to do any of that whatsoever. And mm -hmm. I would, I, I don't know if Farouk al Qasim has ever read George or considers himself a Georgist, but it, it seems very much like 
a very straightforwardly Georgist approach to natural resources, right? Pre-existing things that humans didn't create. Um, Labor is good, investment is good, but um, speculating off of land is bad, right? I mean, in America, a bunch of private companies just sit on oil leases. You know, people said drill, baby, drill back in the day, but it's mm -hmm. like they, they, they could do all the drilling they want. They're sitting on all these, these leases and they're not doing anything with it, you know? So. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I'd never considered that, but the, the guy is in Georgia's in spirit, I'd say. Mark, do you want to uh, give a quick ending note on how you think Georgism fits into the overall broader social democratic project? Sure, yeah. I would say from my perspective, I've always viewed the social democratic project as a pragmatic one. It is about doing whatever works in order to achieve egalitarian ends. And I think, I, I think comparing that to more kind of teleological, you know, kind of broadly, you know, mystical visions of, of abolishing the commodity form and value form and so on. Like I, it's, I find it much more appealing because I think uh, doing what works with the aim of human ends in mind, I think is the right approach. I think my, my own path has always been kind of to look at what works and it's always going to be kind of something in the middle, you know, figure it out, listen to all sides and you find some sort of happy compromise. And I think it wasn't really until, you know, kind of coming off George's mind, I was like, there's not just little market failures, not just little bugs. There is kind of massive inequities built into larger systems. And what do you do with this? And I think overall, it isn't really so much the George's paradigm versus, you know, capitalism, socialism, you know, social democracy and so on. It's more the fact, if you want to pursue any end, you need to plug these holes. And I, I think if you look at the, the, the theory of social democracy, I think it has been maybe a proper amount of, you, know, you take a taste of Marx to show that the you know, labor deserves all it earns. You take a look at different kind of burgeoning welfare theories to show the, the value of, of, of making sure non-workers you know, have a dignified place in society as well. Uh, I think on top of it too, like you just need to achieve ends you want. I think, you know, no one went all the way with any, you know, with any end. And I think you could look at, you know, Hoxaists or Maoists would say, oh, that's, that's why they went so wrong. That's why they're imperialist and so on. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I would disagree. I, I think the method of just having humans in mind and plugging the holes, doing what works will pursue radical ends. And I think part of these ends is, is, you know, basically socializing, resources for human ends itself. So I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I, I think as long as people are, are listening and trying, I, I think uh, I think we're all ending up in the same place and we just need to listen to each other. Yeah. I mean, if you want to hear in my cousin's words, how he would describe Norway, he would describe it as in knallhard uh, kapitalistisk velfredstat, which means a hardcore capitalist welfare state which is like a contradiction of terms to, to an American. I think he voted for center party in the last election. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it kind of like growing up as a Texan and a Norwegian, it's been really interesting to see how, what Americans think Norway and Scandinavian in general is like. It, it kind of gets idolized um, and Norwegians are very, like, like, are, are very practical people, you know, and, um, I would say, uh, I, I don't speak for all of them, but I would say like the Nordic model in my understanding is it's less about like fealty to any big particular idea. It's, it's about getting stuff done and it's about understanding that um, the good stuff is for, is for all of us, right? This is the people's stuff. And by the people, we don't mean like the state, you mm -hmm. know, we mean, we mean the people, right? The, yeah. the human beings. And a big part of that is also like Scandinavia's scale is much smaller. So like, like politics, there's a lot, there's a lot chummier. I mean, it still gets mean and nasty and whatever, mm -hmm. but I mean, Norway has fewer people than the Houston metropolitan area, right? I mean, Denmark and Sweden are bigger, but I mean, um, and that doesn't mean that the model, we can't, we can't learn from that model here just because we're bigger. Um, but um, it, 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 it does have that touch of, it's like, I'm not doing this, you know, they, they, they border Russia, right? They lived through the whole Cold War, you know, and they, you're still required to be in the military when you turn 18 so that you can jump in a tank and, and hope you can practice for what you're going to do if Russia ever invades, right? And so it was always, the model always developed in contrast to the hardcore Soviet model, right? Um, and it was something that was always rejected. Um, the, the Communist Party in Norway has always been this tiny little round party that nobody cares about. Um, but 
what's always been very strong is like, we're going we're gonna to take care of our people. We're going to take care of them. And we're also going to get really stinking filthy rich and buy ourselves a Tesla. Um, like my cousin did. He bought Tesla and I didn't. And um, he bought some Bitcoin and I didn't. Um, <laughs> I don't so much forget the last one for different reasons. But, um, but the other thing that's really important to remember is that um, uh, G.K. Chesterton's words. The problem is not too many capitalists, but too few. The problem is too few of us own any capital. The few of us, too, too few of us own any means of production. You know what I mean? It's like the, the problem is that, you know, and, and, and a big part of the reason for that is that people who gatekeep access to natural resources and valuable locations are able to, without doing any work and without doing mm -hmm. much, much or any investment, just demand private taxation from the rest of us. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I would also just one other, like the Nordic states are certainly not monolithic, especially as it goes to housing policy, land policy can be maybe you know, not, not front stage and center for most of the 20th century. I think Finland yeah, versus- Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Finland versus Sweden, I think is a very interesting case study. I think they both you know, have very egalitarian ends in mind. Finland has large public ownership. They both pursue public housing in different ways. Sweden had a massive success doing public housing at scale in the 60s. Uh, but today, uh, Sweden has no property tax. And I, I think it's you know, not really any surprise that you do see the kind of maybe kind of unhelpful dichotomies. Like some of the most, one of the most annoying real estate speculators I've ever known on the internet was this uh, Swedish guy that like, you know, which is always talking about property he's investing there. You know, kind of, you know, one of the more annoying libertarians. And I think you see this kind of back and forth between the kind of, oh, should we take sacrifices to, you know, house our people or should we embrace mm -hmm. the sanctity of property rights? And that's just such a, a loser's mentality. Like it's not a sacrifice and property rights are no positive end in themselves. And I, I think, you know, I, I think the fact that you see, you know, Sweden, I think, struggle to have kind of the virtuous cycles, whereas Helsinki, I think in the same way, is smooth sailing with their social housing. I, I think that's no, that's no coincidence. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, yeah, that was a great way to end off the episode. I've, I've kept you guys here for like an hour and 25 minutes, but I would really would like to extend a thank you for coming on the show. It was really informative uh, to be sitting here and talking to two people who are so well-versed uh, in land value taxation. I'm sure it's going to be very informative for all the people listening. So um, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much uh, for coming on the interview. Uh, Lars, Mark, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, Anytime. thank you so much. Yeah, sorry for talking over people. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>